Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes? OK, great. My name is Christian, and um, I do public information and events here for the town of Duck. And tonight we have a really great speaker named Kevin Duffus, and I want to thank Jamie from Ducks Cottage uh, for helping um, bring him to here tonight, or all the way out from Asheville. And I also want to thank James Cofield. I don't know where he went. Oh, right there. <laughs> With the Bias Speaker Series for sponsoring our event tonight and having a small reception in the back. Um, there's a bit of wine and some some charcuterie back there if you're interested before or after the talk. So I'd like to introduce Kevin Duffus. He's a noted North Carolina author, filmmaker, and research historian who has made numerous historical discoveries. Wilmington's Encore magazine once described Kevin as a real-life combination of Indiana Jones, Dirk Pitt, and Ben Gates from the National Treasure movies. Kevin says it would be more accurate for him to be <laughs> compared to Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. In 2002, he solved what was called the greatest mystery of American lighthouse history and found the nation's most historic lighthouse lens, the 6,000-pound 1853 Cape Hatteras Lighthouse Fresnel lens, missing since the Civil War. His book, The Lost Light, A Civil War Mystery, follows the incredible 150-year odyssey of the lens. He's also the author of Shipwrecks of the Outer Banks, an illustrated guide, War Zone, World War II off the North Carolina coast, and Cape Fear and Bald Head Island, which spans 500 years of American history. Last summer, Duffus published a commemorative book titled Into the Burning Sea, the 1918 Merlot Rescue, a true story of one of the US Coast Guard's greatest rescues and the topic of his talk tonight. In his first career in television, he produced programs and documentaries in England, East Africa, Central America, and the Philippines. His productions have been honored by the George Foster Peabody Award, the World Hunger Media Award, the Edward R. Murrow Award, and the National Education Association Award. In 2014, the North Carolina Society of Historians, Historians named Kevin Dovis the NC Historian of the Year. So we're very, very honored to have him here tonight, and I'll let him take it away. Thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you, everyone, and it's a, it's a thrill to be back in Duck. I've spoken uh, in this facility one other time, and I travel the state and uh, speak in a lot of different venues, and I have to say you're, the town of Duck's facility here is the finest uh, in, across the state. I mean, you should be very proud of what you have here, and uh, I love coming to Duck, except it's about 20 degrees cooler here right now than it was in Manio at noon today, so <laughs> I don't know what's, what's going on. So uh, let's just get right into it. Of course, I'm, I'm here here to uh, talk about the, the newest book, Into the Burning Sea, but I want to first by um, start by uh, acknowledging and thanking uh, the Board of Directors of the Chickamacomico Historical Association. You'll, you're going to hear me plugging them numerous times because the, the life-saving station there is one of the greatest treasures uh, of the Outer Banks, and it uh, has uh, eluded the grasp of both uh, state and uh, federal authorities, and uh, they've probably had to uh, give up uh, large sums of money to be able to, uh, uh, to run their own operation, but they're probably better off for it. And, uh, but I encourage you when, you, when you're down in that part of the Outer Banks to drop in and visit them and patronize them as much as you can. I also, of course, want to thank the town of Duck, obviously, uh, but also uh, uh, Jamie Hope Anderson for uh, hosting me this weekend and making it possible for me to travel from one end of the state to the other to come speak with you. So, um, uh, Christian mentioned my book, The Lost Light, and we actually sold out of copies over in Manio today. So, if you do have an interest in that, she will have uh, copies uh, at Duck's Cottage probably within a couple of weeks, I think. So, um, but today I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, the Into the Burning Sea. And I want to begin with just a few words about the Outer Banks and the men who helped to establish the standards of lifesavers and first responders that even continue to this day. And I know many of you are familiar with this, so uh, just bear with me, but some of you may be uh, relatively new to the area. And I'm going to be talking about not, not the Outer Banks that you see and exist today, but what was called uh, the Sand Banks many, many years ago before it started being called the Outer Banks. And more specifically, the especially Hatteras Island, south of Oregon Inlet, 
as it existed in the second deca decade of the 20th century. I want to sort of establish what it was like there just prior to this event that took place in the summer of 1918. A hundred years ago, the Outer Banks, and especially Hatteras Island, was among the most remote and isolated places in America. The seven villages of Hatteras Island were tenuously linked by an ever-shifting, often vanishing wagon road. It was really more a myriad of rutted tracks in the sand that wound through woods, across desert-like sand flats, in and around tidal pools and storm breaches. Automobiles on uh, Hatteras Island and even up here were virtually non-existent. There were no bridges or ferries at this time before 1918. There were no telephones except for those between uh, Coast Guard stations. News, information, and gossip was passed from door to door at general stores or barber shops or at church on Sunday. Indeed, it was an age when the only news that mattered, news that had a direct impact on the lives of the residents of each village, uh, was what was happening in their own village. Uh, just imagine today if we didn't have to hear the news beyond the town of Duck, and we didn't have to care what was going on beyond the town of Duck. Well, that was what it was like in the early 20th century. The Outer Banks has been uh, marketed by tourism promoters as the land of beginnings for the early efforts of English adventurers to establish a colony in the New World. I think it's a reason, reasonably good advertising slogan, but it is one that does not tell the complete story because from 1557 onward, this was also a land of endings. I'm speaking of the of endings for the countless seafarers whose voyages in some instances, instances even their lives ended on these seemingly benign sandy beaches. This is a tradition that has lasted for at least 462 years that we know of. That's because in 1584, Native Americans described to English Captain Arthur Barlow a ship that had wrecked and its crew rescued in the vicinity of Ocracoke Island. This could be considered the first documented instance of shipwrecked mariners being rescued by people on these beaches. Uh, Barlow, of course, passed that story of that shipwreck on in a letter that he sent to Walter Raleigh in 1584, but the shipwreck is believed to have occurred in 1557. Well, over the years, storms and increasing numbers of shipwrecks produced jobs in the lighthouse service, the life-saving service, and the salvage industry. As you know, the U.S. government built and operated some of the tallest and most beautiful lighthouses in all of North America and placed life-saving stations every six miles or so along the Outer Banks. Indeed, I think that the Outer Banks could alternatively be marketed as a land of heroes. Their names aren't usually listed in our history textbooks, but Outer Banks lifesavers were exemplary American heroes who deserve to be enshrined in our nation's memory. Names like Malachi Corbell, Benjamin Daly, Richard Etheridge, Patrick Etheridge, and Rasmus Midget were just a few of the many silver and gold medal winning heroes of the United States Life Saving Service who patrolled hundreds of miles of these beaches on the North Carolina coast in those days gone by. Those intrepid lifesavers left the comfort, comfort and safety of their homes and life-saving stations during the most horrifying weather conditions to accomplish miraculous feats of courage, imperiling their own lives to save strangers in, di in distress. Generally, these men were small in stature, but they had enormous hearts and nerves of steel. Hatteras Island lifesavers, and uh, again, I keep referring to Hatteras, but it's, it's all of the Outer Banks, uh, Currituck as well. Uh, these lifesavers were fearless, unassuming, and willing at a moment's notice to launch their relatively small surf boats into sea conditions that would have stricken many professional mariners with trepidation and terror. And in our present media-hyped, famous-for-being-famous world, it might surprise some people that ha uh, these lifesavers of the Outer Banks of yesteryear did not perform their unselfish and death-defying feats of courage for media attention or Facebook likes, or Twitter and Instagram followers. They did those things simply because that was their job.
So that's the backstory for this amazing event that I'm going to share with you today. The, the day uh, about, about 100 years ago or more when six Hatteras Island Coast Guardsmen from Chickamacomico Life Saving Station were about to step onto this grand sandy stage of American history to make history of their own, perhaps even surpassing the achievements and exploits of their own forebears. On the 2nd of July, uh, 1918, a 425-foot-long steam tanker that looked something like a floating Picasso painted in black and white cubist camouflage slipped her massive manila lines and eased out onto the Thames River with the ebbing tide. The ship's destination was New Orleans to take on a cargo of aviation fuel. Then she was to go to New York where she was going to join a convoy for her return to England. She was the state-of-the-art steam tanker Merlot. The, Merlot is the Spanish word for blackbird. Merlot had been commissioned by a Norwegian shipping company, but that company was not permitted to take possession of the ship. Uh, because of the war and Britain's ever-growing demand for merchant vessels, which were being sunk by German U-boats at an alarming rate. It often surprises people to hear that German U-boats sank more shipping tonnage in World War I than they did in World War II. That even surprised me, a, a World War II scholar. Well, Merlot was uh, requ requisitioned by the British government on behalf of uh, the Crown, to serve as an auxiliary for the uh, duration of World War I. Aboard that ship were 51 men ranging in age from 17 to 58 and hailing from 50, uh, 13 different nations. Many of the ship's crew of officers and engineers and stokers and greasers and ordinary seamen had only just met, met as they began to uh, board this ship. They were, in fact, a crew of strangers and a team of men and boys. Their captain was 54-year-old William Williams, a blue-eyed Welshman from a shipbuilding ta town on Anglesey Island, which is a place with its own valiant seafaring and life-saving heritage surrounded as it was by one of the more rocky, forbidding coastlines in the world. Now, the summer of 1918 was a very unsettling time for British merchant mariners like William Williams and their families. The deadly toll on both sides of the Atlantic inflicted by Germany's new undersea menace, the U-boat, and its insidious mines, torpedoes, and artillery shells had been a regular feature on the front pages of London's newspapers. The sinking of RMS Lusitania and the loss of 1,198 innocent lives was among the most appalling headlines that were being read at that time. Well, naturally, for the younger members of Merlot's crew, like 18-year-old radio man Tom Minty, the perils of going to sea in wartime were especially worrisome. Minty had never been to sea before and had no idea how he would fare so far from home. During a pre-departure social gathering aboard the tanker before it left the, uh, the, the vicinity of London, Tom Minty asked one of the other sailors' wives if she thought that they would be okay on the voyage to America. Of course you will, she replied with a smile, yet a feigned confidence. On the same day that Merlot left Tilbury, England, U-140, the newest of Germany's large but very lumbering U-cruisers, maneuvered out of her port on the Baltic coast and laid a course for North, the North Atlantic. Her commander's orders were to intercept and destroy merchant vessels in the busy shipping lanes off New York's Ambrose Channel and also in the vicinity of Nantucket Lightship. But the captain of U-140's ambitions would take his U-boat and the First World War much farther south, all the way here to the Outer Banks and the coast of North Carolina. Just nine days later, after U-140 left, U-117, a 267-foot-long U-boat, uh, and the fourth of six submarines assigned to what was described as the American propaganda offensive by Germany departed her German port. Now that U-boat's principal mission was to lay mines at the entrances to strategic harbors and heavily traveled passages off the U.S. and Canadian coast. But her captain was also said that when told when the opportunity presented itself, he was to sink allied ships with his torpedoes, deck guns, or scuttling charges. 
the U-boat's captain was the dark-haired, five-foot-four inch tall Captain Lieutenant Otto Droscher, one of the Imperial German Navy's most experienced U-boat captains. He was, in fact, the first German U-boat commander to circumnavigate the British Isles, which surprised and embarrassed the British Admiralty, which had underestimated the range and seakeeping ability of the Kaiser's experimental new weapon. Both of those U-boats that I've mentioned, U-117 and U-140, would inflict lasting impacts on the communities of North Carolina's Outer Banks. Now, upon its arrival in American waters off of Cape Cod, U-117 encountered 10 defenseless motor-sailing fishing schooners of the American fishing fleet. And before that day was over, the U-boat plundered and sank nine of those schooners, taking on board practically anything they found useful. Food, tools, charts, navigational instruments, ropes and lines, clothes, shoes, and they even stole the boots off of the the, the sailors of that fishing fleet. Snyder's catch-up was among the more treasured of the Submariner's acquisitions, and they noted that in their log. The Germans also gathered intelligence materials in the form of ships' papers, daily logbooks, sailing instructions, newspapers, and magazines. A small number of the fishermen who uh, were invited inside the U-boat, which was described as being stifling hot, humid, and smelling of diesel fumes and other fetid, musty, rancid, unmentionable odors. The interior must have seemed like a claustrophobic H.G. Wells-inspired labyrinth of pipes, valves, dials, levers and gears and vents, and countless other confusing devices and machines. They looked like a crowd of pirates and were very yellow, one of the schooner crewmen mentioned. Uh, and sure enough, they were in fact pirates, that's how they were acting. But pirating and sinking helpless fishing boats was not going to win the war for Germany and her Kaiser. So U-117 turned south to fulfill her principal mission. Over three days in mid-August, she strung nine mines near Barnegat Shoals off New Jersey, seven mines off Fenwick Island Shoal, and eight mines south of Winter Quarter Shoal, leaving nine of her original 35 mines to plant at Wimble Shoals off Pea Island and Rodanthe on the 16th of August. Right there. Uh, yes. Meanwhile, at the port of New Orleans, Merlot took on nearly 300,000 gallons of the highly flammable aviation fuel benzol and a lesser quantity of paraffin. The British called it paraffin, we called it kerosene. The benzol, the tanker's crew was told, was going to fuel British aircraft that were going, hoping to bomb the German port of Cuxhaven and likely the uh, Zeppelin facility that was located nearby. Britain had been enduring these bombing raids by German Zeppelin uh, for uh, a couple of years at this point. So the crew of the Merlot considered this to be a very noble mission. And for safety reasons, the aviation fuel was loaded in the tanker's 12 forward tanks while the less volatile kerosene filled the two tanks closest to the ship's boilers and engines. Nevertheless, as this ship steamed down the Mississippi River, she was a floating bomb. The fact was not lost on the crew of the tanker who before embarking from the Crescent City on the 9th of August must have read with keen interest this Associated Press version of a Washington Post story about a three hour gun battle between a ship, the OB Jennings and a German U-boat off the Outer Banks, just due east of uh, Kerala in fact. Uh, two days later, that same U-boat, which happened to be U-140 that I previously mentioned, sank the American steamer Merak and the Diamond Shoals Lightship No. 71 right off of Cape Hatteras. For the men of the Merlot, this news was no doubt disconcerting since these were the very waters where their ship was headed. But it was also this rather portentous Associated Press story published the very morning that Merlot shoved off from New Orleans that must have been especially unsettling for Captain Williams. Quote, Navy Secretary Josephus Daniels said yesterday that other sinkings would probably follow. And indeed they did. Seven days later, Williams's Merlot was going to be among the next victims. <laughs> 
Now at noon on Friday, August 16th, surfman number eight of Chickamacomico Coast Guard Station, 31-year-old Leroy Midget, climbed the two flights of very steep ladder steps that lead to the watchtower to relieve his distant cousin, the tall, gangly Clarence Midget, who had been on duty since 6 a.m. The next time you go back to Chickamacomico after hearing this story, I encourage you, no matter how difficult it is, to climb up those steps and go in that watchtower so you can just see what it was like. And it's one of the amazing uh, historic sites in our state in that you can, you can go to these same rooms where all of this history took place. Well, Leroy Midget settled in for what he hoped would be an uneventful six-hour stint in the Spartan Room atop that 1911 station. Now, earlier that day, there had been a storm somewhere far off in the ocean, and Leroy Midget noticed that the cool northeasterly breeze was driving big rollers up onto the beach, crashing on the beach. I know you're familiar with those kind of days. But other than that, the visibility was described as being fair. Well, Leroy Midget nervously paced back and forth in that small watch room, alternating between the windows facing seaward as he scanned the horizon through his binoculars. It must have been rather hard for him to imagine that there were German U-boats out there in the ocean, somewhere lurking beneath the waves, just waiting to sink merchant ships and kill innocent sailors. Remember, it had not just been, it had just been the previous week that the Diamond Shoals lightship was sunk. Midget might have thought there might be one of those U-boats out there right now as he swept the horizon back and forth with his pale blue uh, eyes. By mid-afternoon, traffic began to increase. Earlier in the morning, there were not many ships out there, but suddenly he saw ships zigzagging back and forth, making their way north and south. And at around three in the afternoon, in the direction of Diamond Shoals, Leroy Midget saw the unmistakable white cloud of a bow wave of a vessel rising up from below the horizon. That would be the first thing they would see, is this white froth being pushed up. In fact, the old timers would just say that was, uh, she had, had a bone in her teeth. Well, she was the British tanker Merlo. However, when Leroy Midget spotted Merlo coming up from the direction of Cape Hatteras and Diamond Shoals on the afternoon of August 16th, the Merlo did not quite lo look like this on the screen. This is one of Merlo's sister ships, and I've made this image. There are no surviving image or photographs of Merlo. Well, the hull of the tanker had been painted, as I said at the beginning, in a special disruptive camouflage termed by naval authorities as Dazzle. That was intended to try to confuse enemy U-boats rather than to try to hide the ship. The concept was that a vivid combination of geometric shapes and colors on the hull of a ship would temporarily disorient an enemy observer in estimating the ship's size, speed, and even the direction in which it was heading, thus throwing off the torpedo's targeting data. Sometimes this worked, but most times it didn't. It's not known what Merlot's dazzle scheme looked like. Every single ship's pattern was intended to be unique to further confuse the enemy as to the class of the vessel, whether it was a warship, a freighter, or a tanker. But photos of these ships here, the HMS Cadillac and the West Muhammad uh, here, offer us a few examples. Now, from Leroy Midget's vantage point, just as this ship was nearing the Wimble Shoals buoy, she veered sharply off to the northeast, beginning her 15-minute zigzag to starboard. This was one of the defensive measures that they used against German U-boats, is that every 15 minutes, the ship would change course. What Midget saw next must have seemed surreal to him, because without a sound, a great mass of water shot up in the air, which then rained down upon the aft portion of the steamer. Then a large cloud of white smoke billowed up above the ship's stern. Seconds ticked away, and still there was no sound. It must have seemed at first rather peculiar to Midget. He might have thought that the ship's boiler just blew up. It took 24 seconds for the sound to finally reach the beach, a window-rattling, gut-wrenching roar. Flames burst into the sky, followed by another ominous rumble. I'll be darned, Midget thought to himself. That tanker was just torpedoed. He sounded the alarm. Two floors below, station keeper and chief bosun mate John Allen Midget was fully prepared for that moment. 
He had rehearsed over and over in his mind how he would respond in the event of a torpedo attack. He too had heard the earth-shaking rumble of the two explosions. He already knew in his mind what happened. He guessed that a vessel must have, that the vessel that exploded must have been a tanker. Lives were in peril, he knew that. Not a second was to be wasted. Now, unlike the old days when they would, life-saving service would respond to a foundering sailing ship that would take hours and hours to sink, uh, a tanker on fire offshore called for the absolute quickest response possible. No amount of practice, however, could have prepared the Chickamacomico Coast Guardsmen for what they would encounter after launching their stalwart motor surfboat through the menacing wall of surging seas and breaking waves represented here in this evocative painting by artist Austin Dwyer. The Chickamacomico lifesavers from the beach could see the flames spreading over a large area and the towering columns of black smoke rising high into the air. They could hear one loud explosion after another over the noise of the crashing waves that they were trying to penetrate. Now it was getting to be late afternoon. This was now about 5, 5.30 in the afternoon. Some of these men, uh, John Allen Midget, uh, chose five men to accompany him in this surf boat. They might have been wondering as they were getting, preparing the lifeboat to go to sea, will we be out there after dark? It was a long way out there. Will we ever come back? One Hatteras life-saving crew went out after dark on a rescue back in the 1800s and they were never seen again. In fact, surf boat rescues in the ocean and especially after dark were notorious as the most dangerous of any method of rescue performed by the Coast Guard or their predecessors, the life-saving service. But performing a surf boat rescue upon an undulating sea of fire Amidst swirling clouds of toxic smoke and explosions producing a hailstorm of deadly debris raining down upon them was beyond anyone's experience, training, or imagination. In fact, I, I chuckle when I see these photographs that were posed for a photographer on a nice day when the pleasant weather was conducive for taking such photographs. They utterly, these photographs utterly convey, fail to convey the lifesaver's formidable and intimidating task. Facing an angry maelstrom of surf through which they had to reluctantly launch their stalwart little crafts, Coast Guard surfmen had no choice whether or not to attempt a rescue. No choice. That's because according to their official regu regulations, and I'll read them, quote, the statement of the keeper that he did not try to use the boat because the sea or surf was too heavy will not be accepted unless attempts to launch the boat were actually made and failed. Now timing that 1,500 pound self-bailing surf boat's departure required every bit of the captain's and surfman's skill and experience. The boat was slid off of its carriage and coaxed into the shallow water as the waves knocked those men sideways, forcefully undermining their footing in the swirling sand. Have you ever stood just inside the surf zone and felt that sand go out from underneath your feet? Holding the boat steady and pointed into the oncoming waves as the men leapt aboard was like trying to control a spirited racehorse in its starting gate. Other village men, of course, had come down to the beach to help the Coast Guardsmen. And at the right instant, Captain Johnny, John Allen Midget, they, they called him Captain Johnny, shouted for his oarsmen to jump aboard the boat and start rowing for all they were worth. And then he jumped in over the stern and grabbed hold of the tiller. The oarsmen pulled as hard as they could, their shoulders and backs straining and their feet braced hard against the foot plates of the boat's floor. In fact, it's this very boat on the screen, and it's another one of the reasons why I love Chickamacomico, because the boat I'm talking about, you can go stand next to her and put your hand on her. You can even reach up and put your hand on the tiller that John Allen Midget held. Well, waves broke over the bow and seawater filled the surf boat faster than its self-bailing system could discharge it, making the boat too heavy for its oarsmen to breach the oncoming waves. Those five brave surfmen and their captain tried to gain the open ocean and they failed. Three times they failed. Launching the boat seemed doubtful. The strength of those six Coast Guardsmen began to weaken. According to the government regulations, they had dutifully made attempts to launch the boat. Witnesses on shore surely would testify to their efforts. 
The regulation said they did not have to try again. An inquiry would certainly absolve them for in their inability to perform their service. But at such times, regulations meant nothing to the Outer Banks lifesaver. Whether they were conscious of the fact or not, and I think they probably were, also weighing upon their Herculean struggle were the reputations and legacies of their forebears, their fathers, grandfathers, and uncles, the honor of the Outer Banks lifesaver, not to mention the fate and futures of strangers out there at sea depended on their success. They tried to launch the surf boat a fourth time, and this time they succeeded. Well, they were on their way, but to what fate they did not know or could imagine. The Chickamacomico men, for all they knew, could have been heading to their own horrible, painful deaths. Instead, due to their skill, their training, and their devotion to duty, and perhaps most of all, their heritage, Chief Bosenmate John Allen Midget, Zion Midget, Lee O'Neill, Leroy Midget, Clarence Midget, and Arthur Midget were on their way to making Coast Guard history. They bravely and, un and unselfishly s were able to save 42 of the 51 men aboard the Merlot, many of whom would have surely perished had not the mighty midgets of Chickamacomico had not rescued them. Now, I, because of the, the sake of time, of course, I have to skip over a little bit of this, but, and I may come back to it, but they had to maneuver that surf boat into a wall of, of fire. And when they came out, they came out with these men. It's an amazing story. Now, this Merlot rescue story, even if you might not have heard about it, has been told many, many times in news reports and articles and books over the past 100 years, beginning the very day after the event. The very day after the Merlot uh, disaster. Readers of the Boston Globe on s uh, Sunday, August 18th might have overlooked this one column inch Associated Press story with an August 17th dateline, which was buried on page nine beneath a half a page ad for linen shoes and corsets. You would have thought that this would have been front page news. And oddly, or maybe not so oddly, considering the sometimes the dubious state of journalism today, this initial, initial brief untainted news report would be the first and likely last accurate account of the many retellings of the Merlot disaster and rescue for another hundred years. Here's the headline, Tur Merlot Torpedo 9 of crew drowned, followed by this statement. It was said that the torpedo struck the vessel amid, amidships and that soon after the cargo of gasoline exploded, setting fires to the ship and compelling the men to jump over for their lives. Now, but below that little clipping is a bulletin out of Washington, which was also published on the same day, that actually curiously contradicted the report above and also Captain Williams' testimony as to what caused Merlot's sinking. Quote, according to the Navy's information, no submarine was sighted. Naval officers believe she may have struck a mine laid by a submarine which had been operating in the vicinity the previous week. The government's assertion that Merlot had been sunk by a mine and not a torpedo became accepted as fact for the next 10 decades. Even to this day, trusted published sources in print and online, which are relied upon daily by the news media, school teachers, and their students, persist in parroting the official report that Merlot had struck a mine and was not sunk by a torpedo. This is simply not true, and it's fairly easy to disprove, but it was one of the hardest parts for me to write this book, because I had to explain why. Why did the government say it was sunk by a mine and not a torpedo? Well, at first it wasn't easy for the Navy to try to gain control of their own propaganda. In fact, the government's own weekly official U.S. bulletin published on the 5th of September that year uh, that, re that quoted uh, station keeper John Allen Midget clearly stated that Merlot had been torpedoed, as you can see here on the screen. Uh, also, the U.S. Coast Guard's official annual report for 1918 also attested that the tanker had been torpedoed. But then two years later, the Navy Department succeeded in steering the historical narrative in the direction of a German mine. Within their official post-war report, the Navy said that despite the fact that Merlot's captain, William Williams, claimed he was there, he claimed the ship had been torpedoed, 
The Navy said because no submarine had been seen, his tanker must have been sunk by a mine. Now, when I read that, it makes me laugh because surely they knew that German submarines could go underwater, right? <laughs> well, in 19, 1929, another decade passes, this book titled When U-Boats Came to America, uh, the author also continued to say that the ship was torpedoed. And then again, in 1940, the author of this book did the very same. By the way, this book had the very prophetic last chapter titled, It Can Happen Again. And it sure did. Um, well, it can only be imagined how angry and humiliated this must have made the Merlot's captain reading uh, these stories that he was wrong, that he wasn't torpedoed. And since we're following the tendrils of this pernicious historical kudzu, it was Day, it was this book here in 1940 that influenced our great Outer Banks historian David Stick, my mentor, my be very good friend of mine. But in David Stick's Graveyard of the Atlantic, he also repeated that Merlot had been sunk by a mine, which influenced the Encyclopedia of North Carolina, which even today continues to be uh, the source uh, of information for NCpedia, which is the online source that school kids use. So all s reports that school kids are asked to write about this story all say that Merlot was sunk by mine. So how do we prove the Navy wrong and Captain Williams right? Well, uh, the fact is the evidence has been around since 1920. In fact, it's been in the possession of the Navy from the beginning. Uh, first of all, I just want to re state that the U-boat that, that was responsible for the Merlot sinking was U-117, which was in fact a mine-laying U-boat. And as I said, U-117 went to Wimble Shoals to, to lay its last nine mines. And as Captain Drosher's men in the aft torpedo room of that U-boat were launching their remaining nine mines, uh, he was in the control room looking through the periscope, and a little before 4.30 p.m., as he was about one and a half miles east of the Wimble Shoals buoy, he spotted a tanker zigzagging coming up from the south. And in a very unlucky turn of fate, Merlot crossed directly in front of U-117. Well, the captain of the U-boat temporarily suspended his mine lane operations and ordered a torpedo launched from the bow tube number one at a depth of about 10 feet. It crossed a distance that he was, the U-boat was 400 meters from the Merlot, and the torpedo found its target in about 35 seconds, striking the ship just forward of her engine room. Uh, German U-boat captains were uh, trained to aim for the smokestack, because that's where the engine was. Well, as I previously mentioned, the evidence that Merlot was unlikely to have been sunk by a mine had been in the Navy's possession all along. In fact, in a pocket at the back of their own official report that I was able to use for my research, I found two maps, two folded maps, including this one, titled Summary of Enemy Mining Activities on the Atlantic Coast, and it featured a list of the number of mines at each of these locations that the Germans provided us after the war. And according to the information provided by the German government, nine mines had been planted by a U-boat at Wimble Shoals. There, you can see right there, uh, location G, nine mines. And below that box was the Navy's accounting of German mines located off the East Coast that were either swept up by minesweepers and destroyed or resulted in damage to some of our ships. In this list here, you can see I, I accounted for all nine mines left by U-117. But the Navy decided to add a tenth mine to the U-boat, uh, contrary to what the Germans said. And the reason why they did that is that they had to stick to their narrative. I guess you could call this in 1918 fake news. Um, so you might wonder, why would the Navy insist, Merlo, insist that Merlot was sunk by a mine and not a torpedo, and, and why should we even care? Uh, and sometimes I hear this from people that, you know, wh why, why do we care? You know, this is just history. Well, we can learn a lot about this, and, and one thing, I've analyzed this for a great deal of time, and I came to the conclusion that the U.S. government thought that it, must, it was much better for the American public to think Merlot was sunk by a mine uh, because we had sent all of our destroyers, all of our Navy destroyers had been sent to England. And we had no defenses back here on this side of the Atlantic. And we had no way to uh, hunt down or, or fight German U-boats with what we had, with the vessels that we had left. So it was necessary, there's, there's one of our, that's the minesweeper that swept up all of the U-117 mines at Wimble Shoals. So 
It was really a propaganda effort on the part of the U.S. Navy. I perhaps don't blame the commanders at the time. And, uh, and so with every war, uh, we, you know, our military does not want to panic the American public about what's really going on. And I believe that's what happened. Now we're gonna get to the good part of this story because as a research historian and a nonfiction writer, I prefer not to simply rewrite the work of my predecessors. And I certainly didn't want to rewrite David Stick's book. Uh, I also strive to follow uh, the advice of 19th century American historian Francis Parkman, who said that the successful narrator of historical events must be a sharer or spectator of the action he or she describes. In other words, put the audience, put the readers in the middle of the action. And of course, you're also familiar with, I'm sure, David McCullough, the great American historian, who once said that no harm is done to history by making it something someone would want to read. That's the beacon of wisdom that steers my historical prose. And so for the Merlot story, I hope to find somehow a way without inventing content or fabricating a narrative to take the reader with me into the middle of the action, aboard that tanker Merlot when she was torpedoed, aboard motor surfboat number 1046 as she entered the burning sea in search of survivors, to try to paint a picture, if you will, with words rather than a brush, as this artist did, to try to tell the story in a way that may, would make it something someone would want to read. And as it happened, I was already working on the book, out of the mists of the past came third officer Victor Albert Wild and his amazing eyewitness recounting of the disaster that had been written in his own hand. And also a series of letters that Victor Albert Wild wrote to the midgets of Rodanthe in the months before his unexpected death in December of 1970, many, many years after the Merlot disaster. Mr. Wilde's personal papers and his memories they preserved apparently had been slumbering, undiscovered for nearly 50 years in a file drawer at the Park Service's Roanoke Island headquarters, waiting for someone to find it and share that information with the world. Victor Wilde's testimony resurfaced for me at a very propitious time because it was only months before the Merlot Centennial. And so you and I are the beneficiaries of this discovery. There are no other known attributable first-hand accounts of the disaster, and frankly, I don't care if there are because what Victor Wilde wrote uh, is all we need to know what happened. What he wrote is the thread that binds together the different elements of this historical event, the incomparable lifesavers of Hatteras Island, the crew aboard the ship that was a floating bomb, and the German U-boat that precipitated, arguably, the greatest Coast Guard rescue in U.S. history. We've always heard this story from the lifesavers' perspective. But now we're going to hear it from Victor Albert Wilde's perspective. He wrote, we were making for Wimble Shoals buoy off Cape Hatteras and following the Gulf Stream. Now on that day, this was mid-August, you can imagine how hot it was. And the gasoline in the ship's tanks expanded. And periodically the valve caps to the tanks had to be opened by the Merlot's crew to release the fuel's vapors to relieve pressure in those tanks. So on top of their anxieties of encountering a U-boat or one of its mines, the danger of an inadvertent spark igniting the ship's combustible atmosphere kept everyone on board that ship on edge. In fact, as the fumes of the cargo wafted up through the open ports of the wheelhouse, Victor Wilde as a watch officer constantly struggled to try to stay awake. He was rubbing his eyes and just, you know, and so periodically he would splash his face with cold water from a jug that he kept uh, uh, just for that very purpose. At one o'clock on that fateful day, the 16th of August, Wilde relinquished the wheelhouse to second officer Jim Burns and Wilde retired to a wooden bench in his cabin. Quote, I must have dozed off and then all of a sudden there was a terrific explosion and my cabin pictures all seemed to cave down on me. I jumped up and ran on deck and as I did there was another explosion aft. I went to my lifeboat station and found that it had already been lowered into the water with the second officer and a, a lower ranking sailor in it. He said this was the lifeboat that I was in charge of but I think the second officer got panicky. <laughs> <laughs> 
So Wild went back into the wheelhouse, and there he found Captain Williams, who had just arrived on the scene and had been trying to assess the damage to his ship, while at the same time, he was trying to struggle and steer the ship toward the beach, which was about four and a half miles away, to the west. But with her engine now destroyed, Merlot was significantly losing headway. One of the historical accounts I read said the ship started going in circles around the Wimble Shoals buoy. That's, it's not possible. The ship that just died in the water. Well, Captain Williams shouted above the roar of the flames to Victor Wilde, his third officer, that the starboard lifeboat with 19 men had also been launched. That meant that somewhere on the ship, and most likely in the stern, 17 men were still aboard. They probably consisted mostly of the engineers and the stokers and the gunners that were, had all been gathered at the stern. There was only one more lifeboat remaining, the captain's gig, they called it, the number three boat. Yet it was more than a half a football field away from the bridge, still hanging from its davits behind the aft deck house. Kind of like this picture here. 150 feet away, over the top of a ticking time bomb, and they had to get to that lifeboat. Now, normally the route to the aft deck house from the bridge was via an elevated catwalk uh, above the cargo tanks that went right down the center of the ship, but the other end of it had been crumpled into a tangle of steel by the initial explosions. Victor Wilde wrote, there was only one other way to get to that boat, and that was to crawl along the bulwark or the sides of the ship, which was no more than, say, a foot wide. So we had to crawl like cats. As they crawled along the port side gunnel, Victor Wilde said that he could see some of the men from the overturned number two lifeboat desperately trying to remain afloat in the water. The boat, the boat tipped over and dumped all the men out in the water, and now they're surrounded by flaming waves. One of those men in the water was 18-year-old Tom Minty, the second Marconi operator who on the night before they departed England asked the wife if she thought that they would be safe. Now, six weeks later, the awful scene below became forever sealed in Wilde's memory, for he later recalled that his drowning shipmates in their last seconds of life were not calling for their wives or their sweethearts, but were calling for their mothers. He wrote, what strange things enters one's mind? I could see the poor little wireless officer putting his arms up and going down, calling for his mother. Oh God, I thought, please save me from this fate. Well, Captain Williams and Victor Wilde reached that number three lifeboat, and with the help of the other survivors on board on the deck, they lowered it, and once on the water, they now had to get themselves away from that tanker as fast as possible, because the aviation fuel had yet to ignite. There were so many men in that little lifeboat that they couldn't even get the oars out and row the boat, so there was a sail that they uh, lifted up on a, on a little mast, and they began to move away from that 400-foot-long steamship. Only then they were able to move away from the tanker as she was in her final mournful death throes. Merlot was wailing, Wilde vividly recalled, like a fatally wounded creature. Fire and smoke poured out of her, out of fissures in the hull, and then it happened. The tanks of benzol ignited, wild. After getting not too far away from the ship, she was still just wailing what it seems like to be her end. Then she went up. Oh, what a sight. And then the fire on the water started. The funnel of the ship, the smokestack, went sky high and the sea became one mass of flames. So we had to row as hard as we could because the flames were beginning to catch up with us. They began to strip off their clothing. I could feel the heat of the fire, and some of us in the small boat began to take off their life jackets, and we were about to jump overboard, rather drowned than be burnt alive. Well, it was not long after that that John Allen Midget and his Coast Guard surfman from Chickamacomico Station arrived on the scene as depicted in this painting. And again, unfortunately, the constraints of time will not allow me to share with you the entire story, and it's also my shameless attempt to get you to buy a copy of the book. <laughs> Um, and I do encourage you to read it or buy it and share it with someone who should read it. But in closing, I have a few things to add from the last chapter of the book. Victor Albert Wilde could never forget what he experienced at Wimble Shoals off Rodanthe in 1918. Obviously, he was rescued. He survived. But the visions of his drowning shipmates, 
the seemingly inescapable fires, the heroic efforts of the dauntless men of Chickamacomico Life Saving Station in their little motor surfboat, and the pretty young daughter of Captain John Allen Midget, Bethany, who loaned Victor Wilde her bedroom the night of the rescue, all of these memories filled his mind and reoccurred in his dreams for the rest of his life. Victor Wilde's wife, Annie, was six months pregnant when he left Tilbury, England, aboard Merlot in July of 1918. When news of the tanker's destruction by a German U-boat reached England, Annie was in mistakenly informed that her husband had been killed, along with Captain Williams. So you can imagine what a surprise and relief it must have been when Merlot's third mate returned home safe and sound. In fact, just a month later on the 10th of October, their daughter was born. They named her Joan Merlo Wilde. Now in 1970, nearing his 76th birthday, Victor Wilde was curious if any of those valiant lifesavers from Rodanthe were still alive. His daughter Merlo encouraged him to try to find out. But with, so without the names and addresses of those men, Wilde sat down and wrote a letter addressing it simply to Midgets, Rodanthe, North Carolina, and he put it in the mail. Well, the postmaster of Rodanthe, a woman, and I learned this lesson years ago, is don't refer to post female postmasters as postmistresses, they don't like that. Um, but she received the letter and she knew exactly who to give it to, Bethany Midget Gray, Captain John Allen Midget's pretty young daughter who had loaned Wilde her bedroom the night of the disaster. And over the next few months, Wilde and Bethany Gray began to correspond. And in the end of my book, I wrote that when you actually read Wilde's letters to Bethany Gray, the lessons of history and the true essence of those lifesavers' legacy becomes evident. They, they were given medals and silver cups, and, uh, and in fact, a state-of-the-art Coast Guard cutter will be commissioned this year, uh, named the National Security Cutter Midget, and also that life-saving station. These are not, in fact, they are all wonderful things, but they are not the essence of the lifesaver's legacy. That is found in the flesh and blood and lives of families who would not have lived had it not been for that unselfish act of courage by John Allen Midget and his crew of mighty midgets of Chickamacomico over 100 years ago. In Wilde's words to Bethany, you must realize that had it not been for your father that I would not have been alive today. This is what he wrote to Bethany just a few months before he died in December of 1970. I can see now lying in the bed facing the sea in front of your house with the water still on fire. In fact, he thought that some of his crew members might still be out there uh, hoping to be rescued. He wrote, will you convey to your family and your brothers my regards and tell them had it not been for a brave man, meaning her father, saving us off that oil tanker Merlot, I would not have had the lovely family that I have. And that, ladies and gentlemen, lest we ever forget, is the legacy of the Outer Banks lifesaver, just as it continues today for all of us and our, and for our first responders, our firefighters, our swift water rescuers, our law enforcement officers, and members of our armed forces who all keep us safe and sound and are there when we need them. If the next time you see one of our law enforcement officers or EMTs or firefighters, please tell them thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Pardon me? I'd be happy to take questions. And on any subject, not just Merlot. I'm a Blackbeard expert, although last year was the 300th anniversary and I'm a little burned out on Blackbeard, but. Yes, sir. Torpedo. Yes. Did you all have the, hear the questions? How, what was the opinion of the British government? Well, they they believed their merchant captain William Williams, who said he was torpedoed. Now he didn't see the torpedo, but he and well, there are lots of other facts, obviously. You know, I'm limited by time, and, the, and the, even though it's a small book and it's a quick read, but there are lots of other factors. Uh, two other reasons why it was impossible for the mine to have sunk Merlot. 
One is, is that ship was uh, rigged with what were called paravanes. And what they were, were like two torpedo-like devices with fins on them attached to a cable that was attached to the bow of the ship. And they would throw those overboard and they would span out like 100, 100 yards or more on each side of the ship as the ship is moving through the water. And if it encountered the, the, a mine, it would snag the mine and the mine would slide out to the, where the, the end of the, and there was a cutting device that would chop the cable and the mine would pop to the surface and then, you know, the mine was no longer a threat to that particular ship. There's, uh, but more convincing than anything is that I, in doing my research, and no one had ever come across this, but I was going by, I researched German mines, U-boats, 1917, 1918. And, the, you know, Germans were really good engineers. And so they designed a mine that when it plopped out of the back of the U-boat, it would sink to the bottom, to the ocean floor. And it would sit there for 48 hours. There was a timer. And at the end of the 48 hours, this lock would open up and the mine would start rising. And it would usually stop at about 10 feet below the surface. And they did that because they didn't want to sink their own U-boats. So the U-boat had plenty of time to, to clear the area. So the, the U-boat was there sinking mines when the Merlot passed and it was impossible that any one of those mines would have uh, sunk the Merlot. Any, any other? Yes, sir. Correct. They were tethered, yeah, they were, there was a big heavy base that they would sink. And in the book, I actually have some photographs and diagrams and explain how all that works. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, if, I, if I give too much away from the book, you're not going to want to read it. But, <laughs> but again, maybe you'll pass it on to a young person. You know, young people need to know this history. But uh, John and Malin Midget lived for a number of years. I think it was 1937. He retired from the Coast Guard, and um, it was right before Christmas, and he got in his car, and of course there was still no paved road. You know, you can imagine how hard it was to travel back then. He drove to Norfolk to go Christmas shopping for his grandchildren. And on the way back in Currituck County, um, he went around a curve and a truck swerved, and they had a head-on collision, and it killed John Allen Midget. Uh, very tragic story. Now at the, um, the centennial last August, I had the privilege, there's, there's uh, one woman who is a daughter of one of the lifesavers. And then uh, there were a couple of women who were the granddaughters, including granddaughters of John Allen Midget. So I got to meet them. I actually got to visit with one of the granddaughters who's now in her 80s and um, I sat in the house, you know, where they lived, John Allen Midget lived, and it's very chilling to be, you know, that's one of the great things about that place is that that's, real history took place there. Yes, ma'am. Of all of the uh, research that you've done, do you have anything else that equals or surpasses that limit when you found Wilde's letters? Uh, yes. I mean, and I, you know, I don't know how much you want to hear, but you, you heard I, I discovered the lens of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. I, you know, that was, I was at the National Archives in Washington and uh, ran out at nine o'clock at night and wanted to go hug the first person I found, which I don't recommend on Pennsylvania Avenue, you know, and, um, but, you know, I found that. I, you know, found a Confederate uh, gunboat uh, when I was 17. I, uh, in my new book on Cape Fear, I discovered, you know, the great thing about the lens from the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, and how many of you have been to the, gra the graveyard of the Atlantic Museum? Any? So when you walk in, you see that lens, that lens standing there? That's the lens I found. And, but what you, it, you, what you don't know, and unfortunately they don't really share this with, the, with their visitors, in 1853 that lens was on display in New York City at the Crystal Palace, uh, it, which was the first World's Fair in America. And uh, there are lots of interesting connections with it. The first uh, engineer who assembled that lens in, 19, in 1853, about around July 1st, was a, a topographical engineer whose last name was Meade. Uh, ten years to the very day, that same Meade was on horseback at Gettysburg, General George Meade, uh, leading the Union victory uh, at Gettysburg. And that's the man, first man who touched that lens that's down at Hatteras when it came out of the box. Um, but there, I mean, I could just, uh, there, 
I've been very blessed. I don't know why it happens to me. I've had the skeleton of one of Blackbeard's crew members in my car with me. Uh, and that's a whole nother story. Maybe I can come back to Duck and share that story. <laughs> um, so, but it, nothing gave me more, bigger goosebumps than reading Victor Wilde's story and then realizing, you know, a lot of historians will simply get something like that and they'll go, oh, this is interesting and they'll type it up or whatever, but they don't really take the time to sit and think, what does this really mean? And somewhere out there, you know, by the way, uh, Victor Wilde's daughter Merlo had a daughter and she named her Merlo, but we've lost track of the family. We spent, well, I've spent a lot of time trying to trace that family down in England and uh, we've been unsuccessful. But somewhere out there, there's a woman named Merlo. She may or may not know why she's named Merlo. I've, I've got a feeling she does though. Um, so, but yes, that was a, it's, it's now one of my favorite stories. Oh, and in my World War II book, you know, it begins with a woman on a ship off of Cape Hatteras who was eight and a half months pregnant. And the ship was torpedoed on Palm Sunday and she got into a lifeboat with uh, 20 strangers and uh, at 10 o'clock at night, 40 miles from Cape Hatteras in 20 foot seas, she went into labor and delivered a baby boy. And I spent a lot of time, uh, and they were eventually rescued, and I, I tracked down that baby boy and met him and interviewed him. Now he doesn't remember being born in a lifeboat, <laughs> but he obviously was very proud of his mother for what she endured, and she told the story many, many times. But there are moments like that that I just, I've been so blessed to, to, to come across these stories and then be able to share them with, with people like you. get the wrong idea. <laughs> I don't drive across the straight the state for a glass of rum, but but you're uh. Yes, and I took their slide, I'm sorry. Yes, I can, I can, I did taste the rum and I can really uh, vouch for it. It's a taste, tasty rum. But what they do over there, if you're in Manio, you should go tour the distillery. It's really fascinating. It's pretty amazing that they do what they do. Any other <laughs> questions, comments? Uh, is it I, time I have for- I one quick question. Yes. Is that okay? <laughs> a quick question. There's a, a wreck offshore here that if you dive, most people refer to as the green buoy wreck, but I've also been told that they think it's the Merlot. Do you know if the Merlot, the wreckage oh, of the Merlot has been identified? It's, it's ab no, it's absolutely not. The, I don't think the Merlot would have gotten this far. The Merlot exploded with such force that I don't think there's any sizable part of the Merlot that can be found. They actually really, tried hard last summer to try to locate the Merlot. And it shouldn't be that hard because it, we have the exact spot where the, where the event took place, just a mile and a half you know, off of the buoy, uh, but no one's ever found the Merlot. And I think that it's in a lot of little pieces and they have now subsided into the sort of the murky ocean bottom. And I don't know what the green buoy wreck is, and I should because you know, I'm, that's one of my areas of specialty, it's shipwrecks of the Outer Banks. Um, but they're, fan, you know, th that's a whole nother subject, shipwrecks. Okay, is there any wine any left? Any more questions? Oh, thank you. And I'll be over here, um, and if you'd like to purchase books, and I'll be happy to sign them. And Jamie's been gracious enough to let me sell these books here, even though her store is right here in Duck, but it's gonna, it's gonna help me with gas money to drive back to Asheville. So. <laughs> So if you don't buy books, I'm gonna be stranded somewhere between, no, I'm kidding. Thank you so much, and, and before everybody um, enjoys the reception, uh, our mayor, Don Kingston, has, uh, has a small gift to present. Thank you, Christian. And uh, thank you all for attending this evening.
And a little special thank you to the bias uh, speaker series that represented here tonight by James. And uh, and Ducks Cottage and Downtown Books, which represented by Jamie. Jamie, it's good to see you. And uh, all this is in collaboration with the town of Duck, and a thank you to Christian and Betsy for all the work you do in presenting these series. And at this time, I have a little gift of appreciation for what? you. What? I thought I was Kevin. done. No, not. <laughs> And this is a uh, piece of appreciation and a picture of John Bias and the Bias Foundation, and gladly uh, like to present it to you, Kevin. Well, thank you. That's thank great. You great much. honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking the time to come out here to the Outer Banks and the Duck. And uh, you're welcome back. You got a lot of books you can. Talk you know how about, to so. find me anytime. I don't, but we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, any other questions for him? I'm going to turn that over to Christian. I know, but I'll let her talk. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I should, should have announced that earlier. It's April 24th at 7 p.m. That's a Wednesday. And that will be a conversation with William Cohen. He is a noted financial journalist. Um, and so uh, James will be leading the beginning of that presentation and asking some questions. And then there'll be a free forum discussion afterwards. Uh, after that, in, on May 23rd, with the Dare County Arts Council, we'll be presenting Brothers Like These, which is a reading of poetry written by Vietnam veterans in conjunction with the former Poet Laureate. And then in June, we'll have a professor of Southern history coming, who um, will be presenting about his study of the South through photography. But he also just won a Grammy for his recordings of Southern history, his audio recordings. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and please enjoy.